Psalm 78, you're there, verse 38. It says this, it says, but he, God, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity, didn't destroy them. Many a time, yes, many a time he turned his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. For he remembered that they were but flesh, a breath that passes away and does not come again. But look at verse 40. How often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Verse 41. Get ready. If you're underlining anything, underline verse 41. It says, yes, again and again they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power the day when he redeemed them from the enemy, when he worked his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the field of Zoanta and rivers, and it goes on and on and on. You know, when I was in Bible school, we learned three things about God's nature. We learned that God was omniscient, which means all-knowing, all-knowing. Do you know there's not a puzzle, there's not a quiz, there's not an enigma that is too complex for God. Nothing phases Him. There's no equation He can't balance. There's no problem he can't solve. God, God sleeps peacefully because nothing phases him. Not only that, not only that, we learn that God is omnipotent, that God is all powerful, that God doesn't take any anxiety medication because nothing vexes or phases him. There's no power in the universe, there's no devil in hell that is any threat to him. He is, he is unparalleled in his power, he is unparalleled in majesty, he is uncompromised in his power nothing is too great for your God and my God he is omnipotent the next thing that we learned was that the Trinity we learned that God is also omnipresent the God is omnipresent you and I can only be in one place at one time God can be everywhere and he lives outside of time God created time but he lives outside of time. He is not subject to time. That's why God is the ancient of days, but God has never aged a day in his life. There is no expiration date on God. You and I age because we live in time. God lives outside of time. He is just as young as he was 10 billion years ago. God is a young God. God is youthful. God is young. He has an aged apiece. But you know what? God created time. We know that God created time because time is a trinity. Everything that God creates has his nature in it. God is Trinity and time is a Trinity. A Trinity is three things that exist separate but all at the same time. Time is the past, the present and the future. These things are in play at the time. At at the same time. God is in our past doing some mopping up. He's in our present, engineering things, whispering, leading, guiding, nurturing. And at the same time, He's already in your tomorrow. He's already in your future. He's already gone there and He's setting up. He, the Bible says that, that God has, has preordained good, good works for you and I to walk in. God is already in your future. He's already establishing your tomorrow. He's putting blessing after blessing, provision after provision, miracle after miracle. Everything you need, God is already in your tomorrow, putting it all together. So God is omniscient, He's omnipresent, and He is omnipotent. He is unlimited. The title of my message today is Unlimited. But here's the great tragedy we just read. The Bible says the children of Israel limited an unlimited God. They limited an unlimited God. Not popular preaching. Not popular preaching. Because we want to believe that in the sovereignty of God, that we have no effect. That, well, you know, God willing. You know, I have what I have, God willing. Well, God's not willing that any should perish, but people are perishing. God's will is that all should come to repentance, but not all are coming to repentance. Because God gave you a will. God gave you a will. And for God's will to come to pass, you need to make your will His will, or His will your will. When His will becomes your will, His will comes to pass. God gave you a will. He gave Adam and Eve a will. And so that we wouldn't be robots. Now the Bible says, Paul speaking in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, that these things were written as an admonition that we should learn from them. So I want to give you three areas this morning, just in the few minutes we have left, on three areas where the children of Israel limited an unlimited God. I don't want to get to heaven and have a Homer Simpson moment. I don't want to get to heaven and go, don't! You mean I could, don't, you mean I, oh, don't. I don't want to get to heaven and realize I limited God. 
I want to live this life, take the limits off, and I want to see an unlimited God do unlimited things because my Bible in Ephesians 3.20 says that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that I can ask or think according to the power at work in us. I don't know about you, but I want to go out of this life making the biggest splash, making the biggest impact. I don't want to live getting to heaven and realizing for all eternity, my God, you mean there was more? You mean we could accomplish more? You mean I kept limiting you? Three areas where we limit God. Number one, the first area where we limit God is what you see. The first area where we limit God is what you see. What you see. I'm not sure whether you notice this, but, but God put our eyes in the front of our heads. You ever notice that? Your eyes are in the front of your head. Most people live like fish, especially if you're in, in social media, Instagram, Facebook. Social media makes you a fish where your eyes are on the side of your head, always comparing with everybody else. But you're not meant to live with your eyes in the side of your head comparing with everybody else. The Bible says we're not wise to compare one to another. God put your eyes in the front of your head because you're meant to be forward looking. There's a lot of, lot, of, lot of Christians have what I call rowboat mentality. They have a rowboat mentality. They're looking that way, but they're heading this way. Oh, I remember back in the 80s. Oh, I remember the charismatic movement. I remember wiggles were, and, and we're looking backwards in the good old days. Remember the good, you ain't meant to be looking back at your, if your greatest days aren't in your past, your greatest days are still in front of you. God put your eyes in the front of your head because you're meant to look forward. You're meant to be looking forward. You, 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 what God has for you is in front of you. The Bible says, forget not the former things. Behold, I do a new thing. God's got great things for you. You should be looking forward. Whenever you hear the Word of God, faith should rise. And faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Not yet seen. So God wants to get a hold of your vision. God wants you to see. God comes to a guy called Joshua, and Joshua is right now looking at the walls of Jericho. The walls of Jericho have been prepared for 40 years. For 40 years, they've prepared these walls. These walls are so high and so thick that many archaeologists say that chariots would race around on top. Not only that, we know from the Bible that these walls were so high and so thick that, that they had apartments living in there because Rahab the harlot was living in the wall. She had a, a four bedroom apartment in the wall. So there were apartment structures in the walls of this city. It was a compound. The reason that this, this city was like this is because 40 years earlier, they heard how God had opened up the Red Sea and the children of Israel were coming to this land and they were coming carrying a word that God was gonna give them all the land of Canaan and first stop would be Jericho. So the king of Jericho got all of his, uh, got all of his construction people, got all of his engineers, got all of his architects together. And, they, and he said, how can we save our souls? How can we save our lives? They are serving a God who can part Red Seas. And the engineers had the arrogance, had the audacity to say, we can bring the finest human technology and the finest engineering, and we can create a citadel. We can create a compound that is greater than any weaponry. And, and so literally, when they came to Jericho, it looked impregnable and it looked impossible. But I thank God for a leader like Joshua, and I thank God for a leader like Glenn and Sophia Barrett, because they don't see impossible. They don't see like everybody else sees. Everybody else sees, just, just go around it. Everybody else will talk about the wall. They'll talk about the impossibility. They'll talk about the engineering. They'll talk about the architectural wonder. They'll talk about the strength of the concrete, the strength of the steel the impregnability but God says to Joshua see I've given Jericho into your hand see I've given its king and its mighty men of valor watch this God says to Joshua I need you to see because you can't be a leader without vision the only time Jesus spoke about leadership he did he spoke about vision he said, if the blind lead the blind, will they not both fall into a ditch? Therefore, somebody has to see. The prerequisite for leadership is seeing. If you see what everybody else sees, you don't have, see, you, you don't have vision, you have sight. Amen. Sight sees what is apparent. Vision sees what is potential. You didn't hear that. 
sight sees what is apparent. Everybody saw impregnable. Everybody saw impossible. God says to Joshua, you're the leader, boy. You can't see sight. You can't see what is there. You can't see what is apparent. I need you to see potential. I need you to see that I've given Jericho into your hand. I need you to see that I've given you its king and its mighty men of valor. I want you to see the king on his knees groveling, his crown tumbling from him, begging for a merciful death. I want you to see his mighty men vanquished, chained and cut up and begging for merciful deaths. Because I can only give you what you see. God says to Abraham, lift up your eyes and see all the land that you see I am giving you. God comes to Abram in Genesis 15 and he presents himself to Abraham. It's one of the most beautiful passages of Scripture. How many people know that God loves you? Do you know God's favorite person on the planet is you? Is you. He loves you. And, and, and he, he looks at Abraham and, and just for no reason, no reason. He just says, Gabriel, Gabriel, I'm gonna give myself to him. And Gabriel's like, is, is it his birthday? I'm not even sure. But Genesis 15, Bible says, the Lord appeared unto Abram and said to him, Abram, Abram, here I am, your exceedingly great reward. Here I am, rock you like a heart. He probably didn't sing that. But anyway, he just said, you know, and so, so Abraham, I mean, this is the almighty God who created the heavens and the earth, presenting himself to Abraham. What a day. This is better than stumbling along the beach and finding a little lamp that you rub and I'm the genie. This is better than finding a genie in a bottle that you've got to rub the rub. This is God. This is the almighty God of the universe. Abraham's response floors me. Abraham, after God says, here I am, your exceedingly great reward, Abraham responds and says, so what? I mean, just as well, God's got a healthy self-esteem. He's like, so what? What's the point of all this blessing? When Eliezer of Damascus, a servant born in my house is gonna be the heir, look, you haven't given me a son. Now, Abraham knows that it's a, it's a, it's a vision issue. Whether it's on a conscious level or a subconscious level. He knows the issue is vision because he's asking God to look. Look, you haven't given me a son. Now just, just let me give you the context. The Bible says that the heavens, the universe can't contain the Almighty. And Abraham is trying to ask the great God who fills the universe to look at what he doesn't have. The reason this is in there is because this is how you and I operate. We want God to look at what we don't got. We want God to look at how life has been cruel. We want God to look at our lack of education, lack of opportunity. We were born on the wrong side of the tracks. We were born into a blue collar family. We want God to look at my mom and dad divorced when I was 12. We want God to look at this, this and this and that and the layoffs. And we want God to look at how, we want God to, but God looking at what you don't got doesn't help you. So little Abraham's like, look! And the context is like, the great God of the universe, Gabriel, I distinctly thought I just heard a look. Um, shall, I, shall I Google Earth the universe, Lord? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> look, there it is again, Gabriel. I believe that it came from the solar system known as the Milky Way. Ah, the Milky Way, my favorite solar system. Google Earth a little bit more. <laughs> There it is again, Gabriel. Oh yes, I heard it that time, Lord. I believe it came from the one to the third rock from the sun. Hmm, third rock from the sun. Ah, planet Earth, my favorite planet. Google Earth a little bit more, see if we can find where the look's coming from. <laughs> look, there it is again, Gabriel. I believe that it came from the part of planet Earth known as Mesopotamia. Hmm, Mesopotamia. Some of my best friends live down there. Google Earth a little bit more. <laughs> Look, there it is again, Gabriel. Yes, I believe it came from the area of the Ur of the Chaldees. Hmm, I wonder if that's where Abraham... How is the great God of the universe going to go all the way down and get into Abraham's little tent to have a look at what he don't got? How's he going to... 
So God says, Abram, I've got a better idea. Get out of your tent and look up and begin to count the stars if you are able because more are your descendants than the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Abraham, for something to change in your life, it doesn't change with getting me to look at what you don't have. It changes when I can get you out from under your ceiling, when I can get you out of your tent, out of your confinement, out of your small thinking, out of your small place, get you out and begin to look up and I'm gonna give you a vision for the night, stars in the sky. I'm gonna give you a vision for the day, sand on the seashore, because watch this. God is saying to Abraham, I can't change what's in Sarah's womb until you let me change what's in your vision. I can't change what's in Sarah's womb until you let me change what's in your vision. If you can't see it, you can't possess it. If you can't see it, you can't possess it. If you can't see it, you can't possess it. On the day that Disney World Florida opened, Walt Disney had already passed away. Mrs. Disney was there. And the, the CEO of Disney World Corporation said, as the fireworks went off, as they declared Disney World Florida open, he turns to Mrs. Disney and he says, Mrs. Disney, if only Walt could have lived to have seen this day. He would have loved to have seen this day. She reached up and she snatched the microphone out of his hand. She says, what are you talking about? He did see this day 28 years ago. The reason that day existed was because somebody saw it. Listen, the devil, the devil is a vision thief. He wants your vision to be restricted. He wants your vision to be limited. He wants your vision to be looking at what you don't have, looking at how life has been cruel, looking at how life has been unfair, looking about how life has dealt you a bad hand or a bad blow. Can I tell you something? Get rid of all of that and start feeding on the Word of God. Start getting a vision that is based on the promises of God because until until you see it, nothing's gonna change. Somebody say amen. All right, moving quickly, number two. Numero dos, por favor, number two, number two. We limit God by what we see, but we also limit God by what we say, by what we say. 12 spies cross the Jordan River under the direction of Moses to go and spy out the promised land. The Bible says after 40 days they come back. 10 of them come back with a negative report. Two come back with a positive report. 10 come back saying, yeah, 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 yeah. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. However, the cities were fortified. It was a land that devours its inhabitants and the people are numerous. Hang on, whoa, 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 whoa. Hang on, excuse me, whoa, excuse me. Uh, which one was it? What? Which one was it? You, you said the people are numerous and it's a land that devours its inhabitants. Because it can't be both. You can't have a land that devours its inhabitants and at the same time the people are numerous. So which one is it? Shut up. No, 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 you, you gotta choose. Listen, we're making excuses. Don't, don't let facts get in the way. We're trying to make excuses. We're trying to abdicate responsibility here. Oh, excuse me, go, go ahead, go ahead. It's a land that devours its inhabitants. The people are numerous. The cities were fortified. Moreover, we saw the sons of Anak there. We were like grasshoppers in our sight. Grasshoppers in their sight. We are not able to take it. Now, how many people know there was no interview? How many people know there was no, it wasn't like, it wasn't like you know, they went up to, to the giants and said, excuse me, excuse me, Mr. Giant. Do, could we just do a quick, who are we? Um, we're we're sp sp tourists. That's who we are. We're tourists. We're just touring. Yeah. Um, oh, you are large. And you've got nostril here. Excuse me. Um, when you look at us, what's the first word that comes to mind? <laughs> Filthy little rodents. Okay. Um, that's not where we're going. Uh, what about if you were like, like from the insect family? Dirty little cockroaches. All right, that's closer, closer. What about something that can fly? Grasshoppers, that's the one. Bing, 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 bing. Survey says, top answer. How many people know there was no interview? They didn't, there was no interview. They were projecting, they were projecting 
how they were feeling. See, the grasshopper belongs to the locust family. All the way through the Bible, the locusts come as a curse, as a blight, and consume a harvest that isn't theirs to consume. They didn't sow the seed, they didn't nurture the plants, they, they didn't take care of it, but the locusts would come in and consume. This is what they felt. They never built those cities, they didn't lay down the, those vineyards, they didn't plant those orchards, and they were coming in to possess and to eat something that they had neither planted, nor watered, nor nurtured, and they saw themselves as grasshoppers and so they projected it. They said, we are not able to do it. But thank God there were two, Joshua and Caleb, who said, what are you guys talking about? Their protection has departed from them. Let us go up at once. We are well able to do it. Come on, if the Lord delights in us, hello, He opened up a Red Sea. I think that counts for delights in us. Let us go up at once. Now, who was right, the 10 or the two? Trick question. All 12 were right. All 12 were right. The 10 that said it couldn't be done were 100% correct. For them, it wasn't done. They died on this side of the Jordan River. They died in the wilderness. The Bible says their bodies were scattered in the desert. They were 100% correct. They didn't do it. But the two, Joshua and Caleb, who says it can be done, they were 100% correct. They crossed the Jordan River. They sacked city after city. They took king after king. They defeated giant after giant. Hebron was the inheritance given to Caleb. They divided the promised land of the 12 tribes. Said, listen, whether you say you can or whether you say you can't, ultimately you're gonna be right. The Bible says that death and life is in the power of the tongue. Jesus taught the disciples an incredible lesson at the fig tree. He comes to a fig tree and there's leaves. It's, it's, it's saying, I'm fruitful, I'm fruitful, but he finds no fruit on it. You need to understand Jesus is a little bit tick because a lot of people are like, the Bible says that there was no season for figs. Jesus is not environmentally friendly. Why do you curse it then? It says it's no, it wasn't the season for, you need to understand Jesus, Jesus got a bit of a problem with fig, fig leaves. Ever since Adam and Eve came, we've done nothing wrong. Fig leaves. There's a bit of a problem with them. So he says, let no one ever eat fruit from you again. The next day they come past and it's shriveled up from the roots. And they're like, Lord, the fig tree you cursed. It shriveled up the root. And then Jesus gives them a lesson on the power of their confession, the power of words. But it's interesting because they said the fig tree you cursed. But if you look at the language, Jesus didn't say, stand in front of it and say, I curse thee. In, well, I guess in my name. <laughs> he just said, let no one ever eat fruit from you again. That's all he said. One of the most scariest revelations that I've ever got is that you are never not prophesying. You are never not prophesying. Oh man, I'm such a klutz. Oh, I'm forgetting my memory. Man, we're never going to own a home here. Oh, you stupid, oh, you're just as stupid. You're the same as your father. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. Those who love it shall eat its fruit. Jesus is standing on a platform. Over here is Pontius Pilate. He's just moments away from being handed over for crucifixion. All the people who yelling their accusations. He said he's gonna tear down this temple. He's gonna destroy the temple. He's an enemy of Caesar. They're yelling out all the stuff and Jesus is just quiet. Normally people are arguing back, try, trying to defend, trying to fight for their lives. And the Bible says that Pilate was, was perplexed, was marveling that Jesus didn't respond to any of the accusations. So he says to Jesus, don't you hear these accusations? What are these accusations these people bring? Sayest thou nothing? And Jesus says, I don't need to defend myself. And Pilate says to him, do you not realize this day I have the authority to decide whether you live or whether you die? And Jesus says to him, you would have no authority over me unless it was given to you from above. If my kingdom was of this world, my servants even now would be fighting for my release. But my kingdom's not of this world. Now Pilate had received a note from his wife saying, have nothing to do with this Jesus of Nazareth. I've suffered things in a dream about him. 
he's thinking, what kind of a person is standing there that in a dream my wife can have a visitation from some divine intelligence to warn her? And then he looks at Jesus who says he has a kingdom. And so Pilate, the, the pennies begin to drop and he says, you are a king then. Watch what Jesus does. Jesus does not say, <laughs> You guessed it, I'm the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. <laughs> Watch what Jesus does. He says, it is as you say. I know who I am, but that don't save you. Jesus knowing who he is doesn't save you. Jesus says to him, it is as you say. So if you say he's just a teacher, he's just a teacher. If you say, well, you know, I believe that Jesus was, you know, just a, you know, a figure of human history. He was a carpenter's son who they made, it is as you say. But what you say will affect your eternity. Jesus knows who he is, but that don't help you. That don't save you. That's why Romans 10 verse 9 says, whoever believes in his heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and God has raised him and confesses with his mouth, he shall be saved. For with the heart one believes, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. See, let me just tell you something. The Bible says even the demons believe and tremble. But the Bible says, test the spirits. Any spirit that says Jesus is Lord is from God. But you will find the demons won't cut what they will not confess Jesus Christ as Lord. They believe, but they perish. There are a lot of people that it's not, it's what you say. The, the power is in your mouth. We limit God by what we say. You've got to change what you say. The Bible says that God speaks those things that are not as though they are. Begin to declare that my tomorrow is better than my today, that my God is for me. Begin to declare I'm blessed in the city, I'm blessed in the country, blessed going in, blessed going out, that my hand, the hand of my God is upon me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Death and life is in the power of tongues. Stop cursing your future. Stop cursing your today. Start blessing it. Start speaking blessings. Somebody say amen. amen. All right, because I'm running out of time. Number three, number three, number three, number three. We limit God by what we see. We limit God by what we say, but we limit God by what we believe. We limit God by what we believe. Now, let me just encourage you. I know I'm being a little bit hard. I'm pushing on something. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to rattle your cage this morning. I'm trying to shake some things loose so that God can replace some stinking thinking. You're the smartest people in Manchester because you're here in the house of God. You're here in church. You made a decision this morning. I'm getting up, I'm getting myself ready, I'm getting the kids dressed and we're driving to church. And then just as you're about to drive to church, you had to change their clothes because they spilt stuff all over them and you had to go, well, oh, we're gonna be late now. And you went back in and you got them changed and now you're here today. You are the smartest people in the city because you know when I go to church, I'm gonna hear from a word that has a divine origin. All scripture is God breathed. It is God breathed. It is given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You're gonna hear a word today is going to put something on the inside of you. Listen, the greatest thing that can happen in church is for it to change your thinking. I'm not sure whether you realize this, but the word repent comes from two Greek words, meta noia. Meta, which means to transform, like metamorphosis, to transform, to change. Noia, knowledge, thinking. Repentance is to change the way you think. Every time you should come into the house of God, you should think less like the world and think more like the word. You th should think less like this culture. Jesus said about the culture, he says, Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long? Bring the child to me. There's a, there's a culture that shuts down the power of God and then there's a kingdom culture that releases the power of God. And the kingdom culture is only established in the Word of God. That's why you're the smartest people because today you're leaning in to the Word of God. We limit God by what we believe. Now watch this. There's one miracle that's in all four Gospels. One miracle that's in all four Gospels. Does anybody know what that miracle is? It's the feeding of the 5,000. It's not raising Lazarus from the dead. It's not Jesus walking on water. The only miracle, the only miracle that Matthew, Mark, Luke the physician and John the beloved, all four of them declared has to be in my gospel account is the feeding of the 5,000. Matthew's writing it, Mark's copying. 
stop, Jesus, Mark's copying. You know, and, and then Luke's like, I'm writing it too. No, you're a doctor, write something about the healings. No, I'm writing this. We've got it. Mark and I, leave it. He's like, no, I'm writing it. And then, what are you doing? You know, John, I'm writing it too. Don't, you don't need to, we've got it. It's going to be three of us. You sleep, write something. He's like, no, I'm, no. You know, so four times. Four to all four. All four. Why? Why? Why would it be so important that all four have to have this account? Why? Because it's a snapshot of this life. It's a snapshot of your life. It's a snapshot of my life. It's a snapshot of anybody's life that wants to do something in this life. Anybody who wants to be successful will face this situation. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When God repeats himself four times, it's, it's kind of a good idea to take notice. Just saying. The story is there's 5,000 men. With women and children, they could be anywhere from as low as 12,000 to as high as 25,000. But let's go in between. Let's say maybe there's 15,000 people. 15,000 people in front of Jesus. And the disciples come and say, hey, get rid of the 15,000 people. Send them away so they can buy something to eat. And Jesus says, no, no, you give them something to eat. They're like, if we spend a year's salary, it's not enough to buy anybody even just a little cupcake. And then they're like, oh shoot, we're telling God something can't be done. Uh, there is a lad here with five loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many? Send them away. And Jesus said, no, we don't need to send them away. Sit them down in groups of 50. And the Bible says he takes the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, not looking out at the problem, not looking down at the lack of resources, looking up to heaven. Nothing changes until your vision changes. Jesus is modeling. He's the Word become flesh. He doesn't preach the Word and live something else. He lives what He preaches. He preaches what He lives. There's a symbiosis, there's a congruency. Looking up to heaven, looking up to Jehovah Chira, looking up to the Lord who sees and in seeing provides, looking up to heaven. Jesus takes the five loaves and the two fish, gives thanks, blesses, and then breaks it. The word blessed there is the word eulageo, where we get you Googleizer, one who speaks at funerals. It's a Zoolander quote. Uh, where we get the word eulogy. A eulogy is at a, at a funeral, and the word eulogy literally means to speak well of. I want you to notice, I told you, number one, we limit God by what we see. Jesus' eyes are on heaven. We limit God, number two, by what we say. Jesus speaks well of the five loaves, and He speaks well of His lack of resources. He doesn't curse. He's, he doesn't say, oh my God, man, God, this is unfair. He blesses the five loaves and two fish. Whatever you bless, increases. Whatever you curse, diminishes. He blesses them and He gives them the disciples to set out by the people. So they're now distributing. Now, there was an archbishop who said, you know, the miracle that day was this, that just as the little boy gave away his lunch, the five loaves and two fish, in the same way the miracle really was that the entire crowd took a leaf out of this little boy's look and as the bread and fish came by, oh no, far be it from me that I should indulge in such, and they passed it along. And it sounds so stupid. Because <laughs> when you read the Bible, the Bible says all ate and were satisfied. It's amazing people who represent the Bible that don't actually read it, the damage they can do. So all Adam was satisfied. I'm not sure if you've ever been to a buffet, but nobody ever takes, oh, just enough. People always say, there's always food left over. They always take, our eyes are always bigger than our belly. I need lots of, you know, and there's one guy with two plates. Hey, hey, just one plate per person. It's for me friend. Who's your friend? Um, ba, ba, Brad, Bip. Uh, Trevor, you know, he doesn't have a friend called Trevor. You know, he's, right, he's scampering off, you know, with his two pla you know. And the Bible says everybody ate and was satisfied. And the disciples were like, man, 
that was, that's a miracle. And then Jesus sitting there. And then the miracle doesn't finish there. Jesus says to the disciples, now go collect the basketfuls of leftovers. They're like leftovers? Leftovers? We were hoping it would be just enough and you're talking about leftovers. Jesus says, oh, 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 guys, guys, guys. Did you see what just happened? We got 15,000 people. We got a vision in front of us that is greater than the resources with us. Snapshot. God will give a, a couple a vision of cities. He'll give them a vision of a church, 25 million pounds. He'll give them a vision of location after location after location. He'll give them a vision in front of them that is always greater than the resources with them. Why? Because if you've got enough resources, you don't need Papa God. So Jesus is trying to introduce to the disciples, don't lower the vision. You came to me and you said, look at your lack of resources. Dismiss the vision. Get rid of the vision. Lower the vision down to your provision. Jesus says, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. We don't lower the vision down to our provision. What we do is we understand with our provision, we hold on to the vision, but we engage the God of the vision. We involve Papa. Now, if Papa was involved, I want you to catch this. I want you to catch this, very important. If my heavenly Father was involved, His signature will be on this miracle. And His signature is this, go collect basketfuls of leftovers. The Bible says they went out and they filled 12 basketfuls with leftovers. They filled 12. Listen, you can't put five loaves and two fish in one basket and make it full. Five loaves and two fish would have maybe filled a quarter of one of the baskets. 15,000 to 20,000 people ate and were satisfied. And then they filled to the brim 12 basketfuls of leftovers. Watch, watch God, He's so clever. How many disciples did Jesus have? Coincidence? I think not. 12 basketfuls for 12 disciples, they had to carry one each and the basketfuls of fish and bread were preaching to them, oh ye of little faith. Man, how do you explain this? How do you explain? And then Jesus, it's getting heavy. Exactly, because my God is not the God of just enough. Do you know, we've been told a lie. We've grown up with a post World War II or a post Great Depression mentality that God is a just enough God. That, oh, if I can have just enough to pay my rent, just enough to put food on the table, just enough to keep a roof over my head, just enough. God never thinks just enough. God never does just enough. He always does exceedingly abundantly above. God wants you blessed to be a blessing. All right, quickly grab a seat because I'm, 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 I'm out of time. The first miracle Jesus did with the disciples was He turned water into wine. Water into wine. Crazy. If you read, there were, there were, there were six wash pots. He fills them to the brim. 240 gallons of wine. It wasn't that Jesus was saying, right, no one's leaving until you're all sloshed. <laughs> they don't need 240 gallons. That's 1,600 bottles of wine. I don't think they needed that much wine, Jesus. See, you and I think of the problem of the moment. Jesus wasn't just fixing the immediate problem. Jesus saw a young couple getting married that ran out of money because they couldn't budget for the wine at the wedding. And he's like, let me give you some grace. This is not ordinary wine. The sommelier who tasted the wine said, my God, normally people bring out good wine. And once everyone's had a little bit during all the toast, they bring out the cheap stuff, but not you. You've saved the best bottles till last. It's 1,600 bottles. That's probably 200 pounds per bottle. Jesus says, do it and then just sell the rest. And then you've got 300 and something thousand pounds. Use it as a deposit, a down payment on a house. Jesus doesn't just do just enough. Where did you get this? Where, where, hang on, who, hang on, whoa, whoa, whoa. Who told you? Who told you that God is on such a tight budget that He can only do just enough? 
The first miracle with, with Peter is Jesus uses Peter's boat, preaches. When he finishes preaching, he says to Simon Peter, launch out into the deep, let down your nets for a catch. Peter's like, Master, we toiled all night and caught nothing. But watch what Peter says. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. There was some, Peter was in church. Not voluntarily, Jesus said, I'm using your boat. Oh, you, I don't know who you are. I'm gonna sit in there, make sure you don't steal it. But he's sitting there and he hears Jesus preaching. And Jesus says, launch out of the deep because I don't take something without paying for it. Launch out into the deep, let down your nets for a catch. He's like, I'm a fisherman. When you throw the net out at night, the fish can't see the net, it's daytime. But there's something about your word, I'm gonna bend my will towards your word. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will. I don't have faith for nets. I don't have, Jesus says, let down your nets. I don't have, I've only got faith for net, watch this. So the Bible says that Peter threw in a net. Jesus said nets, he threw in a net. That's okay, God will meet you at your faith. He throws in a net and the Bible says, so many fish came into the net, the net began to break. The net began to break. The net began to break, fish were hemorrhaging and the Bible says they had to signal to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And the Bible says they filled both the boats. Now this is what the Bible does not say. The Bible does not say it when they pulled the last fish out of the net and placed it into the boat, the fish boat buoyancy ratio was in no way violated. That's not what it says. It says when they filled both the boats till they began to sink. This is from one net that was breaking with fish hemorrhaging out that it didn't just fill Simon Peter's boat, it filled his partner's boat. It overflowed into the partner's boat and there was so much fish that with one net breaking, both boats began to sink. So Peter falls on his knees and says, depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful. He saw on that day that God never does just enough. He always does more than enough. He's the God of abundance. He's the God of overflow. He wants to bless you to be a blessing. He wants you to be able to minister to people that don't have a home, people that don't have food on their table. He wants you to be overflowing. But we have, we have adopted a mindset that somehow when God paved the streets in heaven with gold, that it was a little bit extravagant and now heaven's on a tight budget. Church next Sunday, the youth are doing a car wash to raise money. What that means is you'll overpay for them to do a lousy job. <laughs> We've got a Lamington drive next. I mean, what are you doing? What? Last time I checked, God is still the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills as well as a thousand hills. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness there are. We've got to get rid of a small minded. We've got to get rid of a just enough mentality. God does exceedingly abundantly above.